Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Joel Pledge from Crossroads Assembly of God in Three Way, Tennessee. We're so glad that you join us for this Facebook Live broadcast. And if you're joining us by YouTube, God bless you as well. We are excited today to begin a new series on the book of Philippians. We'll be talking about the introduction and those things that led Paul to the city, coming from Acts chapter 16. But I, I hope you're blessed by the Word of God this morning. I tried that. I didn't move, did I? Um, let me just go. <laughs> yeah, I tried to move it. Um, the Bible says to us in Acts chapter 16, let me get that up on the screen, verses 16, uh, 6 through 10. Um, it says to us, and uh, let me get that uh, in place for you. Uh, Paul and Silas traveled to the area of uh, Pythagora and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. All right. Then coming to the borders of Masia, they, they headed to the province of Bithynia, and there began the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went through Masia to the seaport of Troas that night Paul had a vision a man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him come over to Macedonia and help us and so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there <laughs> amen 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 I, I always love it when we do these things live, and uh, there's no way to edit or restart. Um, I, I just recently traveled in, in uh, April to Mongolia. It was there I was praying and trying to find uh, the Lord's direction for the preaching of the Word of God. And I, 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 I want to spend a short time in the book of Philippians. This is a kind of an introduction. We may do a little bit more next week. Um but today is Pentecost Sunday, and I wanted to emphasize being led of the Spirit of God. In our story, we have Paul and Silas, and they are they are heading up what what is modern day Turkey. They're trying to go east. They've already preached in the central part of the country, and and again trying to go east, trying to go back, trying to go further east than what they did before. And the Holy Spirit will not let them. Uh, Luke says it's the Spirit of Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit who is directing them until finally, after many tries, and I find this to be true in, in being led of God, is that we find ourselves uh, testing, is this the way God wants to go? Is this the way God wants to go? Where where am I to, to, to go next? What am I to do next? And in those decisions that God uh, puts us to the test. Will we seek his will? Will we trust in him? Will we go uh, in the direction that he wants us to go? You know, as I said, I, I've, I've spent this, well, I, I've spent really this week focused upon Acts 16, trying to figure out how the Holy Spirit leads. Because again, being Pentecost Sunday, I, I found myself wanting to preach on the Holy Spirit, but needing to get this started or I'll never get finished. And so I, I was reflecting on the ways in which the Lord leads us. What I ended up with is a sermon that was a mile long and an inch deep. <laughs> Many words, but not saying very much. And I may not say much else, but I, I found, I know that you're familiar with this passage of Scripture from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, because it just simply says this to us. Trust with the in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend upon your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you the path to take. Amen. Amen. This is uh, something that we're familiar with. It is a, a verse of scripture that reminds us that we, we must trust the Lord. We trust the Lord. I am. Uh, I, I'll get that. Uh, I'll get that on that screen because uh, Paul is coming to this place 
where he is going to trust the Lord for the next step in his ministry. It is also true, uh, it is also true that he was operating at one, mo at one moment in his own understanding. And again, I'll put that on, there, on that screen because he knows I've been through here before. Maybe we'll just continue on east. There's nothing west. It's just the coast. I, I need to go deeper and deeper into this area. And, 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 and God prevents him. You know, I, I think if we look at the difficult situations of our lives, there's often a, a, a repeat, a confirmation, something that tells us this is the way God wants us to go. You know, in Peter's life, when he began preaching to the Gentiles, he had a vision. It was three times. Now, it was only one setting, but it was three times that a, that a, a sheep came down filled with, with food and, and, and animals that he was not allowed to eat as a Jew. One time it comes down, the, the voice says, Arise, kill and eat. And Peter says, No, it's never happened. I'm not going to do that. And, and now he is... Uh, three times and by the third time he hears that knock on the door and uh, the Holy Spirit says that these men are come for you go with them and they lead him to a place that he's never been and it was Cornelius's household uh, a non-Jew a, a Roman a centurion a, um, a God fearer but yet not someone that Peter will ever eat with or fellowship with or even maybe even talk to we recognize that Peter had those three. In the story that we have, there is this understanding that Paul says, this is the way I want to go. And as he goes, the Holy Spirit restrains him. He tries again, the Holy Spirit restrains him. And it's on that third time that he sees a vision of a man from somewhere else. Now, you know, we don't know. Is this man in a, in a traditional costume? Has he got a, a name played on? Hey, I'm a man from Macedonia. We don't know, but he recognizes this man. Uh, he, he's not preached in Macedonia ever, but now he knows God wants me to go there. There is this loud voice from, from God saying to trust me. Trust me. This is what the Lord is saying over and over. Uh, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. You know, I, I, I find it easy to trust in the Lord if he's, if he's leading me as Psalm 23 opens. <laughs> you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He <laughs> leads me beside the, leads me to, beside the still waters and leads me to green pastures. Well, as long as I'm in a green pasture and beside the still waters and I have everything I need, I find it easy to follow the Lord. Later on in that same psalm, he's going to say something to the tune of, Even when I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, let me ask you a question. Did David just wander off the path, get lost, and end up in the valley of the shadow of death? Or did God, God lead him? Did the same Holy Spirit, the same Lord that led him to green pastures and still waters, lead him through that valley of the shadow of death? If I hear anything from the scripture about being led of God, it is, trust me, do not depend on on your own understanding. Trust me. Trust me. Paul, at that moment, has not preached in Greece. He's not, he's not been there today. But God is going to change his direction. We also know the end of the story, or at least in Acts chapter 16, the very truth that uh, he is going to end up in prison, in a dark prison, at midnight, in chains, having been beaten by rods. Ooh, don't trust in your own understanding, Paul. Don't trust in your own understanding. This is, the, this is what it takes for you. This is what it takes for you, huh? I'm telling you, to be able to navigate this life. If you're going to be led of the Spirit of God, if you're going to follow Christ, you have to trust Him. Because you may be led into a place that you don't want to be. 
and you have to be, learn to trust the Lord. You know, I thought as in my study, and part of my study was, which was extensive, following, trying to follow this lead, uh, uh, this this Holy Spirit leading us, and and I and I turned to Jesus. I said, surely Jesus is is a great example for us, and 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 and, and I know that he, he's going to show me how the Holy Spirit leads and into green pastures and still waters and. And Jesus will be led into those places and he'll be led to those people that need a miracle and he'll give the miracle and he'll be led to people who are hungry and he'll feed them and, 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 and he'll be led in a glorious fashion. <laughs> the reality is, is that Luke chapter four and verses one and two tell us this. Let me, let me, let me just put that up there. It says, when Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Oh, my. <sighs> Where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days, Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just don't know if I want to go there. Don't tell me this. I want Jesus to lead me in green pastures and still waters. I want him to lead me to places of provision. Don't tell me that as Jesus is introduced to the community of faith, the first thing that happens is he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Man, he's had a good day. I mean, he's baptized by, by John. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes upon him in the form of a dove. There's a voice from heaven that says, this is my dearly loved son, and he brings me great joy. Oh, man, I want to be led there, don't you? That place of affirmation, that place where, uh, where uh, 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 that place of his presence, that place of his voice that speaks to me, that confirms I am a child of God. I'm a son of God. You know, that's where I want to go. And if Luke would just stop right there, and he does stop for for a moment in in in, in chapter four, because he or, or, or in chapter yeah in chapter four he, he's going to well in chapter three because he's he's going to go through the genealogy of Jesus, and then in chapter four he's going to come back to those words that we read: Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. <laughs> if the story stopped there, it would be great. If the story stopped in our lives, that we were, we had that moment of affirmation of the presence of God and the voice of God and the, and the, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Wow! But that is not what happens in our lives. Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, was led into the wilderness where he is tempted for 40 days. Now listen, I... Uh, <laughs> If you compare the gospel stories between between Matthew and Luke, uh, there's a little different twist uh, on the stories because in Matthew, he, he's led by the Spirit, same thing. He's led into the wilderness. He fasts 40 days, and after he has fasted, he comes face to face with the devil. He's tempted three times. In Luke, it says he's tested or he's tempted for 40 days. Now, I fasted 40 days, and I know it's one long temptation. I, I, I'll guarantee you. Now, after a while, you're not really hungry, but you want other things. You want the fellowship around the table. You want the, the joy of being with other people and, and rejoicing around the table again. It, it, food is secondary to our eating much of the time. You recognize that you don't always eat because you're hungry. You, you, you eat because you're with someone. You eat because of a celebration. You eat because everyone else is eating. You, you, we, we are taking part in this because of a lot of different reasons. But Luke makes it clear that the whole thing, 40 days, was a, was a test. It was a temptation. And we don't know that in Luke's story uh, were these temptations interspersed between these 40 days or did they just uh, kind of conclude the time of, of uh, wilderness uh, living for Jesus. No matter what, we're confronted with that idea that we must trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, and we cannot depend upon our own 
understanding. <laughs> oh, I know that each of us have faced the wilderness. Now listen, it's easy to complain. It's easy to think of the unfairness of the wilderness. Oh my God, why am I here? But to trust the Lord means that we don't question the unfairness or complain of its harshness. I seek to survive and I seek to learn. Those two things are very important. The, uh, the verse of scripture comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and it's verses, uh, well, probably 2 through 5. Remember how the Lord your, led you through the wilderness these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. All of these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out, your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. Yes, the wilderness is difficult, and you will get hungry and tired. And yes, the wilderness is a test, and nobody likes tests, or most everybody hates tests. But the Lord wants to know what is already in your heart. I believe he already knows what's in your heart. I believe he wants you to know what's in your heart. It's important for you to know. And the wilderness is also a place of provision. You heard that, didn't you? That the Lord spoke about manna and it came into being. The Lord spoke and their clothes never wear, wear out. They've got it. it they're, they're, there's no lacking of the daily needs. Ultimately, that wilderness is a place of trust. I've got to learn to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. It's remarkable that Jesus quotes these words to the devil in his first temptation after he's led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Fast 40 days, and then the first thing is, hey, Turn these stones to bread if you're the Son of God. If you're the Son of God, do this. And he quotes that verse, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Listen, you and I have to come to that wilderness experience in the same way. We're going to be led. We've got to learn to trust. We've got to learn to hear. We've got to learn to hear what God is saying to us. In the life of Jesus, I find one other thing that's very important, and, and, and that's this, okay, that his anointing and calling come immediately after, after this wilderness experience. I believe that God puts us to the test be, before we receive the fullness of this anointing. Now, I don't know that I think he received the Holy Spirit at his baptism, we got 40 days, but he's going to announce his anointing and his calling here in, in chapter 4 and verses 18 and 19. It says, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. Amen. He is. That's beautiful. That the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, again, this is um, this is important because this shows to us this shows to us that as Jesus is being led of the Holy Spirit, he depends upon his calling and his anointing to set the direction of his life. He knew what the Father wanted him to do because his Father had sent him to the earth to do the very ministry that he has been called to do. It's remarkable to me that there is no other reference 
in the life of Jesus that he was led of the Spirit to do anything. One verse, one passage, Matthew 4, Luke 4. Everything else seems to flow out of the anointing and the calling that is upon his, his life. I wanted, to, I wanted to put that screen up there. Let me put that one up there. The anointing and calling that was upon his life. So he would go from place to place, many times just to protect his life. Many times Herod was after him or, or, or the Jews were after him. And, I mean, he left Nazareth because they wanted to kill him. The, 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 those, that movement is of necessity. Nowhere does it say the Holy Spirit led him to Jericho for this healing or led him to Jerusalem for this healing or led him to this place. It, it, it's absent, but there is this idea. I'm going to preach everywhere. I'm going to go from city to city. I'm going to operate in my anointing and my calling, what God has called me to do, I'm just going to do. And wherever he would go and wherever he would show up, there's a need. You go to the Sabbath and there's somebody who would be sick. If he's in a house teaching, they let the man down through the roof uh, and he heals his lameness. There is that need that arises because Jesus is there. I think this is true for Paul and for Silas as they're set apart by the Holy Spirit, or Paul is in Acts chapter 13, a prophecy comes out in the Antioch church, separate from me Barnabas and Saul for the work of the ministry that I've set apart for them. And, and that is Paul's missionary call. Now he's already got a call upon his life at his conversion, but he has this missionary call being sent out by the church. That's when he makes that first trip huh, through what 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 is what was biblically called Asia Minor, but we know as modern-day Turkey. So Paul's been set apart by the Holy Spirit there in Acts chapter 13. and Acts chapter 16, he's looking for a place of ministry. And in his life, there's a one time, this one time, major time, that he is led of the Holy Spirit to a place. He doesn't know what it will entail. He doesn't know the challenges that he'll meet. He doesn't know the blessings that God is providing. I know that in the short story of, of Acts chapter 16, Paul is going to cast out a demon out of a young girl who's a fortune teller who's making money for her owners, and that Paul is going to end up being beaten with rods, put in jail, put in chains, put in the, in, in the darkness of the inner jail at midnight. We also know that a church will be born that night. We know that out of that desperate experience comes a church, and it will be a church that will love Paul. The church at Philippi will send offerings to Paul when no one else will send an offering. A church that will send a representative to Paul to care for his needs, to be with him when they cannot. Again, no other church does this. This church will be a source of blessing for Paul throughout the rest of his life and ministry. Let me just compare these two for a moment, Jesus and Paul, because Jesus... Or Paul is led to a place of ministry, Philippi, where he is rejected, beaten, put into prison. Jesus is sent to a place of ministry and rejected, beaten, nailed to a cross, and put into a borrowed tomb. Both struggled to get to the place where God was sending them. Paul praying three times before he has the vision, Jesus praying three times for God's will to be done in his life. Both of them are praying. They're praying men, and Paul is praying for that direction, and Jesus is praying, if there's any other way, Father, let's do it. If not, your will be done. Neither one knew the exact outcome of what was about to happen next. If I could say it this way, they don't know the outcome of their trusting God. Peter will say it this way in Peter. I think it's in 
around chapter 2, he says, uh, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He entrusted himself. He gave his case over to the one who judges justly. Jesus doesn't know the outcome of his death. Will the Father receive that sacrifice? Will the Father accept this as, as, as payment for the sins of the world? Will, will, will he resurrect me? There's, there's a little bit of hesitation. There's a little bit of not knowing. Paul had no idea what was going to take place in Philippi, but he trusted the Lord. Both of them are going to receive the reward of their trust. Paul's going to be released from his prison without staying the whole night. He's going to be released and, and uh, uh, allowed to leave town. Jesus is released from his prison of death, that borrowed tomb, and enters a ministry that goes beyond anything imaginable. It is trusting in the Lord. Trusting in the Lord. You and I must come to that point and to understand uh, the importance, I believe, of what I call the twofold nature of the leading of the Holy Spirit. The twofold nature of the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that comes uh, from this passage of Scripture in Psalm 119 and 105. He says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Can almost get it on the screen, but I, uh, I can't. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Um, we'll hold that for just a moment. All right, there it is. You know, the decisions of Jesus and Paul are big life decisions. Paul is changing the course of his ministry. Jesus, of course, uh, there's no greater decision that was ever made than that decision to go to the cross. They're crucial to faith. They're crucial to our salvation and even to eternity. There is no bigger decision. You know, in Paul's case, the whole New Testament huh, that Paul writes is written to these churches, with the exception of Galatia. Galatia is there in Asia Minor. But Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Philippians, Corinth, Thessalonians, Philemon, Timothy was found in Asia Minor. Titus was was a traveling companion in those places. These are all essential books written because that Paul was led of the Spirit of God. Obviously, in the life of Jesus, there is no more important decision than the decision to go to the cross for us. I know it was made from the foundation of the world. I know that Jesus declared it to his disciples. I have come to give my life a ransom for many. But I also know in that garden there was that decision, not my will, yours be done. And that decision brings salvation to the entire world. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that verse out of, out of Psalm 119, 105, as it says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Paul has his anointing and his calling. That's the light for his path. That sets the course of his life. I'm going to go from city to city, and I'm going to preach this good news of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm going to do. But he also needs a lamp for his feet, because what do I do now? What do I do here? The, the light for the path is like that light off in a distance that leads me. But now I've got to see this light because I've got to make it to the place where you want me to be. Jesus had that calling and that anointing as well. I put that, you saw that verse on that screen that, that says, uh, let's see if I can, uh, yeah. Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews, is, is calling the people to, uh, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and to run the race and, and uh, to cast off sin. And he says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. We do. He's the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame, and is now seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. 
Did you see that? Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross and disregarding its shame. Let's contemplate that for a moment. Let's contemplate that for a moment. <laughs> Jesus has a focus. His focus is not on the cross. His focus is not on the darkness of the day, the difficult task that is set before him. His focus in that garden becomes the potential end of his sacrifice. He will bring salvation to all who call upon the Lord's name. He will sit in a place of honor at the right hand of God the Father. The light of his path is clear. He knew that he had come to be a, a, a life, to give his life a ransom for many. There it is. It's out there. I know which direction that I'm going. But in these moments in the garden, there's a confirmation of the will of God that came. He knew this is the way to accomplish the goal that I have. It was not necessarily new information that God was given to him of the will of God. Well, oh, my will for you has changed. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying that the, Lord, the word of, the, of God has been leading him up to this moment uh, for his entire life. And now this lamp that is around his feet that shows him these are the steps I am to take to achieve and to arrive at the place I want to be. And I must be. This is the will of God for me. Okay, so Paul's path has been illuminated by the word of God to him. He knows that he's going to testify to Jews and Gentiles and to kings, to Caesar himself. This was the prophecy given to him in Acts chapter 9 when he is converted. But now he needs a lamp for his feet. Which way do I go? Which, which path do I take? I can't get it in my own understanding. I've got to seek the will of God. I've got to pray. I may have to fast. I've got to know which direction. The Holy Spirit is going to lead him. The Holy Spirit is going to show him a vision of a man from Macedonia. Paul is going to follow the vision. You know, the most important decision that you can make in your life is to trust in Jesus, to allow him to be the light for your path. This light sets the course and direction of our lives. <laughs> you know, it sets the course and directions of our life. When I set my, make a decision to follow the Lord, every, uh, many other decisions fall into place. You know, I don't have to worry about gambling. <laughs> I don't have to worry about drunkenness. I, I don't have to worry about going to, to uh, or being involved in sexual immorality. I, I don't have to worry about those things because those choices are taken off my plate. I don't go to the casino. I don't, I, I, I don't go to the places, uh, to, the, to the bars or, the par, or to, to the party place because those things are just off my agenda. I've got a light. I'm following that light. I'm, I'm pursuing that light that is before me. If I need a, a, an understanding of where to turn immediately, then I've got a lamp for my feet. I've got to take that step because my road is changing. I've got to take that step. There'll come times in that wilderness And you've got to understand that the same rules apply for the wilderness and the green pastures and still waters of God. The rules are the same. They are trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do and he will show you which path to take. Father, today I'm praying the Holy Spirit be our guide. There are people today that need, Lord, to make that commitment to follow you. They have no direction in their life. They're wondering, they don't have purpose or meaning, and 
Lord, be the light of their path so that they can see you. They can focus their attention upon you and who you are, and that will set the course and direction of their life. Father, there are those in the wilderness that are complaining and that are struggling, and I pray, Lord, in these moments and this time that they will say, yes, Lord, I will trust you. I'm not going to trust my own understanding. I will trust you. And we do that. We declare that in the name of Jesus, Lord, I trust you. I trust you with my life, my family, my fortune, everything that I have, everything that I am. I trust you. Lead me, guide me, Lord. Wherever it is, I will learn, and I will learn to trust you above all things. I give you praise, Lord, this morning, and give you thanks for all things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. Learn to trust the Lord. Trust in him with all your heart, all your heart, soul, and strength, everything that is in you. Boy, if you can just trust him, I'll guarantee you, you won't have to stay in that wilderness forever. Learn its lessons. Get out. Get into the promise of God. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be with you. We're so happy that the Lord has allowed us to share the word with you this morning. Amen.